When I question a doctor during his pretrial deposition, why would the doctor ever voluntarily tell me what the standard of care was for a particular scenario? You want to know the answer? Come join me for a moment as I share with you some terrific information. Hi, I'm Jerry Oginski. I'm a New York medical malpractice and personal injury attorney. Okay, so you believe that your doctor was careless, causing you significant harm and injury. And now a medical expert confirms that you have a valid basis for a case. So we go ahead and proceed forward with a lawsuit. Your doctor denies all of your allegations. All right, so now during the course of the lawsuit, you will have an opportunity to be questioned by the attorney who represents the doctor. And they'll be asking you lots and lots of questions during a process known as a deposition. It's really nothing more than a question and answer session that's given under oath. And that takes place in our office, in our conference room. And there's no judge there, there's no jury there, but there is a court reporter, a court stenographer there to record all of the questions you are asked and all of the answers that you give. And you should know something very important. The answers that you give in response to these questions really is your sworn testimony. And it carries the same exact weight as if you are testifying at the time of trial. So now, after you are done being questioned, a few weeks later, I will have an opportunity to question the doctor whom you have sued. So now, in the title of this video, I ask the question, why would the doctor voluntarily tell me what is good and accepted standard of care for the type of treatment that you had? You want to know why? It's because when I have a chance to question the doctor during this pretrial question and answer session known as a deposition, and by the way, lawyers also use the term an examination before trial. It's the same exact thing. When I question the doctor, I will be asking him lots of questions about what he did for you and why he did it. Importantly, one of the key things I have to ask the doctor is, what was the standard of care for a patient who presents with the following complaints? Doctor, would you agree that it's important when you see a patient for the very first time that you take a detailed and thorough history? True? Yes. That's good medical practice, isn't it? Yes. So why is the doctor agreeing with me? Because he has to agree that that is appropriate medical practice. And I want the doctor to admit in his own words, what is good practice? Now why would I do that? Because later on, as I take him through step by step of the treatment that he rendered to you, the injured patient, I now will be able to contrast what is good medical practice that he's already told me is appropriate compared to what treatment he rendered to you is not good medical practice. So I always want to get the doctor to tell me what was the standard of care. Doctor, I want you to assume that Mrs. Jones came into your office on January 1st and she presented with the following complaints of A, B, and C. Would you agree that in that instance it's critical that you take a detailed and thorough history? Yes, I would. Would you agree that after obtaining a detailed patient history, now it's critically important for you to perform a physical examination? Yes, I would. And the reason why you do a physical examination is so that you can determine for yourself, clinically, by putting your hands on this patient, what is going on with her. And you can make observations about that. Isn't that true? Yes. And would you agree that failure to perform a physical examination in light of those patients' complaints would be a departure from good and accepted medical care, true? After obtaining a detailed history and doing a physical examination, typically you will come to either a working diagnosis or reach a conclusion about what problem the patient has, correct? Yes. And in some instances, you may not know at the moment exactly what the patient has, correct? Yes. Good medical practice then would require you to rule out certain problems, certain diagnoses, in order to eventually come to the conclusion of what this patient has, correct? Yes. And one of the ways to do that would be to do certain diagnostic tests to rule in or rule out certain conditions. Isn't that true? Yes. So again, what am I doing? I'm getting the doctor to acknowledge what is good medical practice. I'm getting him on occasion to go ahead and also recognize what is not good medical practice. And then I'll ask him hypothetical questions. Doctor, would you agree that failing to do the following things would represent a departure from good and accepted medical care? Well, I wouldn't agree with that, counselor. Well, that's because you don't agree with our set of facts. Isn't that true? Yes. And if your case goes all the way to trial and the jury ultimately believes your version of the events, now I have testimony from the doctor that says, if you did not do A, B, and C with this set of facts, Yes, that would be a departure from good and accepted medical care. So why do I share this with you? 
I share this with you just to give you an inside look at what really goes on in these medical malpractice cases here in New York. You know, I do recognize, and I understand you're likely watching this video because you have questions or concerns about your own matter. Well, if you're thinking about bringing a lawsuit and your matter happened here in New York, but you have not yet started a lawsuit and still have questions, what I invite you to do is pick up the phone and call me. You know, I answer questions like yours every single day and I'd love to talk to you. You can reach me at 516-487-8207 or by email at jerry, G-E-R-R-Y, at oginski-law.com. That's it for today's video. I'm Jerry Oginski. Have a wonderful day.